Hello everybody, my name is Jeremy, this is Red Means Recording. I'm currently sitting in the dark for a reason. I wanted to show you something real quick, and that is this. And also, this. But it's really the first thing I want to talk to you about. Uh, today's video is going to be about acoustic treatment and these wonderful panels I got from a company called Sciacoustic. Uh, these panels were sent over by Sciacoustic. I installed them, so you could consider that a paid promotional video if you want, and that's why it says paid promotion. But I really want to talk to you about acoustics sound, what this stuff is doing in this room, and how you can use acoustic treatment in your room and why you should use it. As you see, these have beautiful art all over them. Um, they also have LEDs behind them, which I can change the color of. Our triptych back here has these really, really wonderful uh, lights which light up the room on the front. All this art was stuff from the Sci Acoustics website. And yeah, um, they wanted me to make sure this video wasn't too like salesman-y. So that's all I'm gonna say about them for right now. Um, what I wanna talk to you about next is uh, sound and why this stuff is doing what it's doing. Also today is a big day for us because a new puppy is coming into the house. My partner, Brian, is going to the breeder. Uh, he works in search and rescue and uh, we are getting a puppy to train in human remains detection, which is a specialized version of search and rescue. Uh, you can probably guess what that's for. So so uh, later today, there will be a puppy, uh, a squirmy little barky little German Shepherd puppy, and I will include footage of said puppy in the video if you stick around. So we get acoustics and we get German Shepherd puppies. I don't really see why you wouldn't want to watch this video. My CPM is just going to go through the roof. Retention. Here we go. Do you want to say hi? Are you jealous? This is not the puppy. This is Riker. He's our first German Shepherd. He is four and a little bit, and he is trained primarily in air scent, but also uh, is being trained in human uh, remains as well. Our, our, our property has a lot of bones on it, amongst other things. Um, and we bring the dogs out there to look for bones and things. And Riker is very good at it. I'm gonna be reading from this iPad because there's a lot of facts and figures I wanna make sure I get right. So what is sound? Uh, it's a vibration. Um, it's an acoustic wave and it travels through mediums at a certain speed. That speed through dry air at uh, zero degrees Celsius is 1,086.9 feet per second or 331.29 meters per second. So uh, like 1,100 feet per second. Sound is pretty fast as you probably already know. And it's a wave as you probably already know. Different temperatures and different mediums will actually affect the speed of sound, which maybe you did not know. I don't know, I don't know you. So in human beings, we can hear a range of sound uh, based on its frequency from 20 Hertz, which is really, really low up to 20,000 Hertz, which is really, really high or 20 kilohertz. Most of us can't hear 20 kilohertz and most of us can't hear like 30 to 20 Hertz. That's something that we actually feel on those sub bass levels. And throughout we react to sound differently. Um, but yeah, that's the range of human hearing if we had perfect computer ears that were based on human uh, anatomy. The interesting thing to note is that that 20 hertz wave, that super, super low wave that theoretically we can perceive, it has a wavelength or the amount of time it takes to uh, finish one pass of its wave that is 56 feet. So a 20 hertz wave, that super low end, is a 56 foot or 17 meter long wavelength. And then alternately up at 20 kilohertz, we are looking at 1.7 centimeters or 0.67 inches for its wavelength. So really, really big variation in how long these wavelengths are. And this starts to become important when you look at a room and you start measuring how long it is and thinking about how long a wave can actually propagate in a room before uh, it encounters another medium besides air. And that's really what you have to worry about when you're talking about acoustic treatment is when a sound wave hits a medium that isn't air, things happen to it. And those things are what we are trying to mitigate with these panels and other forms of treatment. So what does happen when a sound hits a medium that is not, uh, you know, air? Um, well, it's going to do a few different things. It's going to reflect, it's going to refract, um, and these things start to create sort of copies of the wave that bounce around and lose uh, energy depending on um, how they hit things. And they all are gonna bounce around and arrive back at your ears, like my ears right now, sound is bouncing around this room even though it's well treated, there is always going to be a little tiny bit of that happening. And this leads to all kinds of really interesting physical problems, uh, like problems in the way that uh, sound accuracy is perceived. So sound can come out of these speakers right here. It's going to go 
and hit its first reflection point somewhere over there. Once it does that, it's gonna bounce, 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 bounce. It's gonna come back and it's going to possibly hit my ears in such a way that cancels the phase of it, which would create like holes in either the stereo image or in uh, the frequency response of what I'm hearing. Low frequencies can hit things and uh, because of the way that they work, come back and just create standing waves or room modes. And if you ever play like a, a low sweep, a sine wave and walk around your room, you'll hear these room Room modes. You'll hear them like like pockets where like the certain bass frequency just drops out, or where the uh, bass frequency gets really boosted, and and those are room modes. They're like little standing wave pools in your space. Um, those are pretty difficult to treat. We'll talk a little bit about how low these things go down. But <laughs> one of the ways that I used to like check my mixes in bass just to see how things like related down there would be like I would go stand in the corner of my room because there was like a really intense room mode there for like the sub basses. So I'd be able to like really hear the relationship between the kick and the bass by standing in that, that area right there. Generally, as people who mix audio, we want to get the most accurate representation of what's coming out of our digital audio workstations as we possibly can, which means we do not want the room to interfere, which means we do want to keep waves from bouncing around and doing weird shit. This is one of the reasons that things like auditoriums and concert halls are built the way they are. First of all, they're not built with like these cubist sort of hard angles. They're usually softer. They're meant to direct sound back to the listener in a specific way. And then the materials that are used are softer. They're not like hard concrete and stuff like that. And these make a really big difference. The concrete reflects almost absolutely. And you can get really crazy, like almost car plus strong things going on. Really bad reflections where the sound just bounces around forever. We have, a little, we have a little car plus strong synthesis. Come here. Um. When sound bounces around, we actually get two different things that can happen. One of them is a reverberation, and one of them is an echo. Generally sound, like me talking to you right now, is considered a continuous thing. You can tell when sound is there, you can connect it to the previous sound, and that is part of your experience of me talking as a sound. The same goes for any other sound. We actually have a 0.1 second sort of concept of uh, separation between sounds. It's very, very quick. Because of this, if a sound bounces off another surface and comes back to us within that 0.1 seconds, we won't really hear it as having been separated from the original sound, which means we'll experience it as a reverberation. So you know what a reverb sounds like, you know, it's a sound that has a bunch of other diffused copies afterwards. Well, that's kind of what's happening. We have no perception of the sound being separated from the original sound. The other version of that is an echo, and you probably know what an echo sounds like. It's when you actually have separation between the original sound and the second sound. You can start to discern copies of it. And I've heard both in spaces, you know, it really depends. Um, most of the time when you clap in an untreated room, you'll hear like a slap echo, like very, very quick. Um, and or you'll also hear a reverberation. And that's because you're hearing the difference between reflections that are coming right back at you or early reflections and the diffusion network of the room, which is creating the reverberation sound. So this is all very, very cool. Like you can go into a room and really pick up really quickly on what the, the room modes are, what the frequency of the room is. Different rooms have different shapes and different lengths and different material. So they're all gonna respond differently to how your sound moves through them. And that's gonna be very apparent once you move through your rooms. Each room has a sort of feeling to it. Every room has a sort of like liveliness or lack of liveliness that's determined by its shape and the material on the walls that isn't air. Here's a very lively room that if I was to take this away from my mouth where you're getting the most like direct sound and put it over by the camera, you would hear the room. So let's do that real quick. Here, I'm gonna put this down here. And if I move back here, you're gonna hear the room more than anything else. And this is normal, we're, we're used to this. Like this is something that our ears just deal with. What I mean to say is we don't want our ear speakers to deal with it when we're dealing with our speakers in our room that we're actually making music in. That's all that I mean. This is my messy room. Every room has a different sonic profile, like this one, which has this really weird property where someone just says no a whole bunch. And also there's a dog. You can't use this. Outside, you know, you can get echoes and reverberations, but they're gonna be pretty spread out depending on what you're in. Like, if I go like this, ah! I can definitely hear a reverberation. Uh, it's echoing off all the hills over there. Uh, all the trees are doing a little bit of work. Ah. It happens out here too. It just doesn't happen in a way that like really is gonna interfere with my recording. <laughs> Unless you hate birds. So what does it sound like if we go from outside here into a bin? Well, let's see. The material here should make things sound a little differently. 
Now I'm inside a bin. It's actually not bad. It does sound different. Sound is arriving back in my ears very quickly because it's bouncing off all of the plastic in here. And it definitely has a quality to it, which is different than being outside the bin. I'm not really sure which I prefer, honestly. So why do bathrooms sound so good? Is it because you're a good singer? Or is it because of the reverberation of this material? Making you sound like you're in a concert hall. I can promise you it's not because you're a good singer. It's probably the physical manifestation of sound being reverberated in a small space thanks to the medium just passing through and reverberating. One thing I used to do before I had acoustic treatment was I used to go into my closet to record vocals because in here, you're full, it's full of clothes, right? Yeah, you got some reflective surfaces here, but like clothes, these things want to slurp up all your audio. These things, blankets, stuff like that, they all want to slurp up all those reflections. So this is a really great place to record vocals. I'm gonna do a quick slap real quick. Yeah, I can hear like a little slap echo, like a little tiny pitched car plus strong thing going on there where the delays are all sort of in line, they kind of pitch up, but overall, it's not a bad place. So if you're looking for a little recording booth on the cheap, go into your closet if you have one. Oh my God, there's so much information here. Let's see, what else? Oh, oh shit, is that a puppy? Let's go see the puppy. Okay, so I've been told that puppy, well, the car that's transporting puppy is arriving very shortly. I'm supposed to come out here and greet her, like meet her for the first time so she, she, she knows me. And then I'm gonna get Riker and we're gonna go down to a neutral place and we're gonna introduce them to each other. Where's the puppy? The puppy's in the puppy. How's the puppy? Uh, crying. Did she cry? She cried a little bit. Oh, I see a little nose. Yeah. Oh, oh she, she puked a lot. Yeah. Oh, don't step in your puke. Did you decide on Echo or Nova? Uh, is it Echo? Oh, she's so soft. Holy shit. Take care of You're not making any sound. You're nowhere near as... Oh, there it is. She's very tiny. That's a lot of wacky. He drew a lot. One of her ears is sticking straight up for some reason and the other one is flopped. She is. There's the girl. Is that a waggy tail? A tiny little waggy tail? It is, just a little bit. Where's the white pub? Is this her special, yeah, is this her special white pub? Her twinkle toe pub? These are her pubs. And then if you go up a little bit, there's a snoot. She is an echo, so if you tap this, she becomes tempo synced. She's not very big. And there's about, you can see, she fits right here. And this is what her favorite thing to do is right now. She loves this. This is her favorite activity. So we know that we do not want fluttering. We don't want reverberation. We don't want echoing. We don't want room modes. We don't want phase cancellation. We want sound to reach our ears as closely as possible coming out of those speakers right there. And you may be saying, well, Jeremy, why don't you just use headphones? And I agree. I use headphones all the time. I love headphones to death. I live in headphones, but I also like checking my mixes on my monitors. The other reason that I want stuff like this in the room is because I sing and I do VO. I don't want you to hear any kind of echo or reverberation on my voice other than the ones that I choose to put into it uh, in post-production. So it's it's more than just like, oh, make speakers sound good. It's about how uh, my voice in this room travels as well. Um, and that's the main reason that I've been using acoustic treatment for, for a long time. So let's talk about what these are and what they're doing. So first of all, they're mineral wool. It's a material that is been used for acoustic uh, panels for a very long time. Um, the other is like fiberglass installation, which you know you really don't want to work with yourself. Uh, they're not dissimilar to each other, but they both have a really, really good absorption coefficient depending on um, what brand and stuff that you get. The other thing that you have to keep in mind with acoustic paneling is the thickness. So the thicker that they are, the more they will absorb. So the way these work is the sound goes in, it goes through the mineral wool and its energy is lessened. It's actually turned into heat. Then it goes through the wall behind it, bounces back through the mineral wool. And again, the energy is lost as heat. So these are constantly turning 
sound into heat <laughs> and, and deadening and absorbing, which is really, really cool. The thickness of these panels is what determines uh, the frequency that they can work down to. All of these panels are four inches thick. You can see they stick off the wall quite a bit, but I kind of like it. It, it actually kind of makes my room feel more cozy, which is great. These panels go down to 125 hertz, which is fantastic. The two inch panels that they sell, I think go down to 550 hertz. So I will not get my super low bass handled by these. I could get bass traps in the corners, but I feel like this is one of those things that's kind of a war of attrition. I'll never get this room completely soundproofed. And yes, that is the right term for this. Soundproofing includes this kind of stuff. I'll never get this room to the point where it is acoustically perfect. And that's okay, you probably won't either. That's okay. Getting to know your monitoring equipment and getting to know the tools that you have access to is much more important than uh, trying to chase the dragon of an acoustically perfect room. So how do you know how many of these panels you need and where to put them? Well, that's where the first reflection point stuff comes in. If you took like a laser pointer and you put it on top of this speaker and shot it across the room, you would see where the first reflection point is. That's a really good place to put an acoustic panel. Also behind you here, because waves are going to slap back against here especially if you have speakers pointing back at the wall and they will immediately be out of phase and do weird things to uh, your image and to uh, what you're listening to. So first reflection point behind your stuff right here. And then if you can, a ceiling cloud is a really good idea as well. Now these are absorbers, not diffusers. Diffusers are things that scatter the sound away from a reflection point and those are viable as well. I'll put some links in the video description uh, for resources that go into this stuff quite a bit. Uh, there's two really great sound on sound articles about treating your room that give you a lot of insight into how you might be able to do it. That uh, article also argues that using a mirror <laughs> anywhere in your room where you can see your loudspeaker is a place you could treat. But really, we're talking about like first reflection point sides uh, and behind. Those are really great places to start if you wanna treat your room just a little bit. So installation of these things was definitely a thing. I had my partner, Brian, help me. We went into studs uh, throughout. Um, the installation guide for the product says that you don't need to, but I put my last acoustic panels into studs, so I just kinda want to do that this time. So all of these things are going into that with the exception of our ceiling cloud, actually. Our ceiling cloud is actually all done via toggle hooks. All in all, the install took about four days uh, in between work schedules and stuff like that. It wasn't terrible, um, but I'm so glad that it's done because now I guess get to enjoy my studio and I know that uh, everything is chill. So that's about all I have to say about this project. Um, my thanks to Psy Acoustics for reaching out and being patient with me during my stress of the move. Um, <laughs> trying to get this all up and running uh, right after the move was quite a chore and uh, they were very responsive and helpful. And like I said, you know, they gave me some good advice as to where to put things. They also helped design uh, the placement of all these, which was really, really nice. So check the link in the video description for Psy Acoustics uh, if you're interested in panels like this. They do custom art as well. If you have any tips or tricks regarding acoustic treatment, I'd love to hear them in the comments. Let other people know how you have tackled this problem. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's one of those things that not a lot of people talk about because I think a lot of people don't do it. But once you have a space that, you know, you can at least like a space that you're renting, like that you are going to stay in for a while, you can get stuff that will make the room a little bit better. Um, it's definitely one of those things that it took me a number of years into my career before I decided that it was something I cared about, um, but your mileage may vary. I hope that you enjoyed this video. Um, thank you so much for watching. My name is Jeremy, this is Red Means Recording, and I hope you have a wonderful day.